Okay. <clears throat> okay, so um, about uh, half the class has uh, submitted homework uh, three, so that means I'm still waiting on several more. Um, so, they don't have any questions about any part of that. All right, well, I, <clears throat> if you're having difficulty, please ask me outside of class, um, or otherwise, just get it turned in soon. Um, okay. Um, I've put out uh, the next, okay, <laughs> I put out the next uh, quiz. Um, that's the start of uh, homework four. So, um, okay. First announcement, um, all problems for homework four have been uh, posted. Um, okay, so all the explorations have been picked out. Um, and then the concept checks, again, not all of them of either kind have been necessarily been assigned, so be sure to check for that, because uh, I'm not covering everything in a chapter. Um, or in uh, even in these sections. Um, I don't have all of the Canvas quizzes posted yet, so I have uh, the first half up through 8.3 um, is in there, and then the next couple days I'll have uh, the rest of them. But, but the, the questions are already known since I'm just taking those uh, from a book. Um, okay, and uh, please keep in mind that um, actually I should change the due date. I really mean December 8th, not 7th. Um, eighth is the uh, Friday of uh, finals week, so if turned in then, gives me just enough time over what is bound to be a ruined weekend anyway, to uh, grade whatever's there and get your final grades into SOAR for uh, the following Monday morning. Um, so, but um, I'll be able to, I'll be able to make uh, overall grades known um, over that weekend. Um, since of a, a final exam will be on uh, Tuesday of that week. Um, okay, so the, basically the sooner you get in homework four, the sooner I can figure out your uh, your overall grade. Um, okay, next. Um, okay, but what, what I want to point out is, obviously that's going to be an extremely busy time, uh, you know, being finals and all. So, and I know it's going to fall on deaf ears, but not something to let wait till the last minute. Um, so that's why I have these you know, deadlines for quizzes and suggested deadlines for the various sections. Um, you know, it's only a few problems each section. Um, so, uh, so, so do yourself a favor. Um, try to you know, make some progress on those um, well before the deadline because you know you're going to be slammed around that time. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so anyway, I tried. So... It's on tape, so yeah. Um, now, uh, about the final, let's talk about that. Okay. Um, so, um, and actually, I'd forgotten that I mentioned this quite some time ago. Um, I just remembered it yesterday. Um, that the final is in um, uh, two parts. Uh, okay. So the first part okay, um, so the first part is what I call, or I guess what you would also refer to as um, regular problems. Um, uh, so similar to um, the uh, practice exam that I've uh, posted on the site, pointed out to, that out to you last time. Um, so um, and it covers uh, problems from uh, chapters two, six, eight. So problems dealing with uh, numerical differentiation and integration, uh, like using some of the techniques that you're about to see. Um, 
and uh, um, actually the, the, t the integration techniques that I'm actually going to be covering uh, this coming Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Yes, sorry, I am having class the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, but at least I'm not doing something like giving a test. <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> I've heard that evil is afoot on that day. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but unfortunately, I do need to cover stuff and um, important stuff on that day. So, um, and then also the following Tuesday, which will be the last uh, regular class, uh, or at least last class that I'm covering new stuff. Um, okay, um, so you have an idea of what's going to be a very, also you know, various interpolation techniques, um, a couple of uh, problems from chapter two. And then the other part is. And those of you who took uh, DE with me will be familiar with this, uh, the uh, lightning round. Um, so that will be um, uh, uh, questions about the concepts. Um, and to get an idea of what to study for that, um, but the easiest tip I can give you is uh, similar to the uh, concept questions you, questions you get, concept check questions you get. On uh, the homework, um, so no uh, essential definitions. Uh, questions I like to ask on these are, if, in the case where you have more than one choice of a method to use, for instance, various methods of interpolation or integration, um, what's an advantage of one method over the other? Things like that, um, and uh, or what are the you know uh, essential properties that various methods have? Why do why do we have them? Um, so. Um, I may I may ask for certain uh, definitions that that'd be important to know. I'm not going to have you like, you know, state this theorem. Um, I'm not looking for you know that level of memorization because this isn't really about memorization. Not no, nor are the other problems. Uh, that's why there's there's a I provided a formula sheet uh, for that. This is a, I'm not interested in what you can parrot. I'm interested in um, how well your higher brain functions work. So so really both parts. Are about that, um, just um, uh, uh, different aspects. Um, also, um, I'm not going to give a uh, practice for the lightning round. Uh, for one thing, you have something available. Probably, if I were to put out a practice, it'd be much like the concept questions that are already out there um, for, for these uh, uh, same chapters. Um, I'm probably going to give like probably about you know, 25 or so questions, like 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 and answer 20 of them, something like that. I'll know more when I've actually uh, uh, written that part. Um, and um, those of you who've had classes before have heard me fume about this. I mean, I, I, in general, I believe, I, I like the concept of idea of putting out practice tests, and I'm sure it's something that students appreciate also, because then there aren't, uh, it, it minimizes surprises, uh, unpleasant surprises on the test. Um, but there's also the annoying tendency of students to simply put down the answer to a practice test question on a real test question that is different. But questions are different. And I say that a zillion times, and yet it still happens. So, um, uh, so I, I, and I'd rather um, not have that in this case. OK. Um, so, so I may not be putting a practice, but you're not left high and dry either. Um, OK. Now, um, one um, thing that I'm open to doing, uh, I, uh, so I have done this in, in the past. I, like Actually, the last time I taught this class, there were not quite as many students, um, but still a, a, a fair number of them. Um, okay. um, so I am open to giving um, an oral uh, final exam, uh, where it's something, in other words, you can go ahead and take the one that's uh, going to happen on, 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 on Tuesday of finals week. Um, or um, if you let me know that you would rather go the oral route, you can. Um, but uh, you're going to get challenged either way. So um, I would. Um, it would uh, probably take, um, hmm, let's say, um, 
basically you'd be, you'd be grilled for that long. Um, so, uh, and also, you know, both versions of a final, whichever one you pick, are going to be comprehensive. Uh, so the uh, so questions can come from, from any of the, well, not chapter one, but any of the, the, the three main chapters uh, of, of that we've seen. So that amount of time is blocked, blocked off, which meant that if everybody chose this, this would be hard to schedule. Um, but uh, my, my schedule's a lot more open during finals week than the rest of the time. Or if someone wants to um, make their finals week a little easier in exchange for doing this for the week prior, um, you can. Um, so, uh, so just uh, let me know what you want to do. And again, this is on an individual choice basis. Um, and then uh, anyone I don't hear from, I just assume they're taking the regular final. Okay. Yes. So I'm assuming you're like doing the regular final. Um, that format is a little bit limiting. Uh, I may have you work out certain things. Um, it's there's more of a focus on on the conceptual because um, I'm I'm gonna see how you think on your feet. Uh, that's 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 gonna be important. So um, I certainly wouldn't have you writing MATLAB code on the board. But again, not having you write MATLAB code on paper on this. The regular final either. So, um, probably the, the most MATLAB question I might ask is if I provide a snippet of code and ask you a question about it. Um, but I have a feeling that if I were to put a problem where I say, you know, write a MATLAB function to do such and such, that I'd probably cry at the answers. So, um, <laughs> can you deny it? No. Okay, I didn't think so. Okay. Um, right, but if you have any questions about our format, uh, just, just let me know. But I do need to talk about um, logistics for the uh, written final. Um, okay. Um, so, because this happens in two stages. Okay, so first, on Thursday, uh, November 30th, that is the last class that we have. Um, so first, uh, there'll be some time to review. Um, so that'd be a great time to ask any questions you have about the problems from the uh, practice test, or there may be time for that, like the class period before then. Um, um, then, uh, last part of class, I'm aiming for, mm, say, like uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, to uh, start the test. Now, um, I, uh, an important point, um, let's see, uh, okay. On that, so on that day, um, I'm going to be at the coast. Um, actually, none of the golf park students are there today, so, <laughs> but if they watch the video, and they should all be in attendance on that day. Um, that's, that's, that's where I'm going to be. Um, so, um, so, so I'm going to conduct a review from down, down, down in Gulf Park. Um, and then, um, um, so up, in, uh, up here, I will have uh, a... Tr a tr um, uh, so Teresa Combe is going to be, one of our graduate students is going to be on hand here to uh, proctor. Um, so <clears throat> don't give her a hard time, you'll regret it. So. Okay. Um, and uh, so what will happen is, um, so, so, so then I'll have the, uh, so, so she'll leave me the, the, the test that you take up here, and then I'll just gather the ones from, from the coast, and... I'm, so I will um, look through them and mark on them um, where you've gone wrong, if you have, or if, if you completed a problem and got it right, I'll I'll just I'll just mark that so you can forget about that problem. Um, and then for the second part of this, on the following Tuesday, December fifth. Uh, um, okay, so. Um, so the marked up tests will be uh, redistributed. Um, 
uh, for you to complete in the uh, two and a half hour period. Um, so that's a uh, four fifteen to to six forty five, um, and uh, so I'll be up here for that. So um, at the coast. Um, so um, um, sorry, I just spelled the name wrong. Uh, Ms. Nakeen uh, will, will uh, proctor. So I, so I will. So for uh, Gulf Park students, I will um, mark up the tests on that Thursday, um, and then leave them with uh, Ms. Nakeen then, and then so so then she'll have them to uh, give back to you guys. Um, okay. So all told, you're going to have a little more than three hours total broken up under these two stages. Um, so hopefully, so if I've uh, prevented you from going off the rails um, from what your work on the, on uh, Thursday, then you can be on the right track on uh, Tuesday. So, um, so, so and uh, very important. Um, So at least start as many problems as possible, uh, because if something's going to go wrong, chances are it's going to be from picking the wrong approach, um, uh, and maybe, like maybe not really understanding what the question is is, is asking or taking to be something else. So at least I can. So if, if you give a start on um, most of the problems during that time, then I can um, check that. So then, uh, because if you leave it blank, I have nothing, no feedback to offer you. Um, okay. So, so that's how the final is going to uh, play out. Um, I will try to have those graded as quickly as possible, like by the next day, so you can get an idea of um, where you stand, aside from the still needing a result of um, uh, homework four. Are there any questions about well, anything related to the final? I have a question. Yes. Um, so that Thursday when you mark our errors or if we did something right, yeah. will we not know about that until the following Tuesday? Um, unfortunately, yes. That's how that works. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I'll try to see if somebody, they talk their exams down here at Finish. Um, I'll have to see if somebody's still around that late in the day for me on that, on that Thursday, but I'll be up there at Tuesday to take some money. Okay, so if you have any difficulties, let me know and something can be Figured out. Okay. Uh, as far as uh, as far as Thursday goes. Um, oh, uh, Jeremy, do you have a question? Um, undecided at this point. Um, like right now, there's I have eight regular problems. I'm still debating whether to like if I leave it at that, then that's going to be like forty, sixty, because then like five points each, or I might. Put a couple more of those on there to make it 50-50. So I'll I'll sort that out soon. But each part's definitely going to be worth a lot. Um, okay, other questions? Um, yeah. No, I, that that is an option. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, oh, it's for, well, what, 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 uh, okay, so what we've done this before is um, you just let me know you want to take that. And then we figure out a time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and it's probably the same stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Um, as far as uh, what kind of, well, I've given some ideas of the kind of questions. Uh, again, concept check would be a very good thing to study. Um, it's um, because um, I may have you work out something in the board, but. Um, so it's when a writ, with a written test is more about details. A oral test is more about higher level concepts. So, um, so I guess you can choose based on which you feel more comfortable with. <clears throat> Other questions of any kind, or on or on homework for that matter. Floor's open for whatever. <clears throat> okay, so 
Um, all right, so, so, so you have time to, to, to think about that. Let me know uh, what you want to do. All right. um, I also want to mention that um, uh, while the type of questions on an oral will be um, of, you know, type of questions will be similar. Like if, if, if uh, say two of you decide to, to do that, um, and whoever takes it first, um, you know, the questions will can, will still be different, um, but just of a similar level of difficulty or, or same coverage area. Um, so um, there's not really any advantage to be gained um, by having some idea of, of of, of what I asked the first time. Okay. Um, all right, going once, going twice. All right. Okay. Um, so we're in the middle of uh, numerical integration. Um, okay. So where we've uh, just been um, learning about uh, Newton Coates rules. Um, so they are uh, uh, convenient um, because um, you're, t you're evaluating f at equally spaced points. Uh, those are the uh, uh, nodes. Um, but uh, they're only effective at um, at the low degree. So if you use a uh, Newton Coates rule with many points, even uh, you know ten or more, um, then you can get uh, negative weights and to get uh, very poor uh, results. Um, so, uh, so uh, the, the uh, so the bind that we're in is a few points or many points can lead to uh, large error. Uh, just for different reasons. Um, so, um, and so to elaborate on that a little bit, whoops. Okay. So when you have few points, the error is uh, proportional to um, b minus a raised to some power, different power for each rule. So if the interval a, b is large, that invites uh, uh, large error. So that's one reason why using few points is, is not good. Um, uh, many points can get uh, negative weights, uh, which uh, spells doom for your approximate uh, integral. So, um, so newton coates rules are just a starting point. We need uh, to improve on them uh, in some way to, to get around these problems. Um, and that's what uh, today is about. Um, composite uh, rules. So these use interpolatory rules of low degree uh, to avoid uh, negative weights um, on subintervals of AB. Um, of, a, of size H. Now um, we're going to assume that we're dividing into subintervals of equal width and that equal width will be H. Um, H is assumed to be small, and that's to avoid large error due to this uh, power B minus A that you have um, in your error. Because um, now, it, so what happens is if we just use a interpolatory rule like a Newton Coates rule on a subinterval, now we have the error on each subinterval proportional to H to the P. And now that's going to be small. We actually want a large power um, in that case. So we're basically turning a, a, a disadvantage into an advantage. Um, OK. Um, so that's the, the main subject of today. If I get through that, um, or if not, then certainly for uh, Tuesday, um, more sophisticated uh, techniques. Um, Gauss quadrature, which actually is the most sophisticated at all, of all. Um, also, uh, Romberg um, integration. And I say dot, 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 that's pretty much all, unfortunately, that uh, there will be time to cover in this course. There were some others, uh, like uh, adaptive techniques or techniques for multiple integrals. 
that are, are covered in the book, but we, we won't have time. Um, so there's definitely a lot more out there, but having these uh, gives you a good idea as to the um, level of effort that's gone into developing uh, methods for approximating integrals to um, uh, high accuracy. Because in Cal 2, if your instructor covered it, there are some, uh, so some of this is uh, mentioned there, and it gives you an idea, it's like, oh, that's all there is, and no, not even close. This, is, this actually is a still, I mean, these techniques have been around for quite a while, but um, they are, um, uh, there's, there's still a lot of development going on um, in, in this area. Okay. Um, so I want to recap here. So these are the Newton three. There are, I mean, there are many. Uh, there are other Newton Coase rules, but these are the three that were covered um, last time: midpoint rule, trapezoidal rule, and uh, Simpson's rule. And um, I want to uh, indicate for these kind of rules, how do we classify them? Um, so, uh, so the midpoint rule. Um, Uh, first one I did mention last time, degree of accuracy is uh, the highest degree of polynomial that's guaranteed to be integrated exactly. So it's 1 for a midpoint rule. In other words, any linear function, uh, degree 0, 1 polynomial will be integrated exactly. Also, it is a, um, it's an open uh, newton coates rule. And what I mean by... Uh, um, an open Newton coach rule is that the nodes um, do not include the um, endpoints of uh, A and A B. Um, otherwise, if, if it does, then we say that the um, uh, the rule is uh, closed. And uh, whether a um, uh, Quadrature rule of any kind is uh, open or closed um, is important for uh, how we design composite rules as efficiently as possible. Okay, so a trapezoidal rule, how we classify that, um, that is also degree one, uh, but it is a closed uh, rule because the um, closed, can't type today, it's a closed rule because the nodes are the endpoints. Um, a and B. Um, and then finally, uh, Simpson's rule. Okay. Okay. Um, that is uh, degree three. Um, and that's also, well, open or closed. It is closed. Uh, so so we have the endpoints A and B included among them the nodes. Other nodes too, we have the endpoint. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's all fine Danny to get the quiz submissions during class, but as long as you're also paying attention to what's going on during class too. Um, okay. Now, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, take these three newton coates rules and fashion them into uh, composite rules. So first we have the um, okay. uh, the simplest one to work with is the composite trapezoidal a rule. So, for, so now how composite rules work in general um, is you divide the interval a b into n subintervals of uh, equal width h, and it's facing h, so that so it's just going to be b minus a over n. So that formula um, we're going to use uh, throughout, um, and the uh, nodes are taken from uh, the endpoints 
of subintervals, or of a midpoint. That's going to be important for a midpoint rule. Um, so the endpoints are xi, and that's equal to a plus <coughs> ih, and i goes from 0 up to uh, n. So we have n plus 1 possible nodes, or as I said, for a midpoint rule, we might take the midpoints between these um, nodes. And uh, so the way it works is you apply a Newton Coates rule on each uh, subinterval or a pair of subintervals, if that's more convenient. Um, so it just depends on which rule we're applying. Um, now, there's an advantage of uh, applying a closed rule. And uh, so the distinction between open and closed that I was just talking about, um, that one node, so one of these x's, is shared by two applications of the um, Newton, Newton Coates rule. I should mention that in today's discussion of uh, composite rules, I'm only going to be taking Newton Coates rules. We haven't learned any of the rules yet, um, but we will see more later. Those can also be made, any rule can be made composite. Um, I'm just focusing on uh, Newton Coates because those are the best known or the easiest to work with. Okay, and so this idea of uh, uh, sharing nodes, that's going to be made clear by what I'm about to do. Okay, so the composite trapezoidal rule, the way that works is um, on each subinterval, of each n subintervals, I'm going to um, actually, I'm going to make this having several steps. Hang on, it's going to look screwy for a bit, but okay. All right. So on each um, subinterval, I'm going to apply the uh, basic trapezoidal rule. Now, the basic trapezoidal rule. I'm going to scroll back up to that for a second. Okay, watch what happens here. We have the width of your interval, b minus a, over 2, and then the sum of the function values at the endpoints. Now here it was done for all of a, b. Now I'm going to do it for each subinterval. Um, so, I hate these question marks up here. I have no idea why it does that. So the i-th subinterval has uh, endpoints um, is um, x i minus 1 x i for i equal to n. So we have n subintervals all together. So the first x 0 is just a. So I'll remind you of that. Uh, so x0 is equal to a, and xn is equal to b. All right, so I'm going to apply a uh, trapezoidal rule on this subinterval for each i going from 1 to n. So, so what that means is I have a width of that subinterval, which is h, over 2, and then I have the sum of the function values at the endpoints, xi minus 1. So I'm taking these endpoints, xi minus 1, and then f of xi. Okay. And let's not forget the error. So that's my approximation. I'm going to throw in the error also. And um, let's look at the error from before. So here's the error. It's uh, the width of a subinterval cubed times the second derivative at an unknown point over 12, and we have a minus. So I'm going to take this error formula and put that in down here. So, all right, so what I have is, okay, I have my minus, 
and then I'll have f double prime at some unknown point, and, and it's going to be a different unknown point for each subinterval. Um, and then uh, over uh, 12. And then I have the width of a subinterval cubed. Okay. So, so now this is what I get just from a straightforward application of the um, basic trapezoidal rule. Um, on each of these uh, n subintervals. Okay. Um, all right, so, any questions about where this part came from? All right. But now, what I need to do is um, condense this. Um, like, so, what's going to happen is, if I were to write this out, uh, instead of using a summation, at least for the approximation part. Um, I would have, well, first, the h over 2 can be factored out of a sum. So then I'd have f of, so for first, i equals 1, f of x naught, and then um, f of x1. So that's the first subinterval. What would I have for the second subinterval? The h over 2 is taken care of. So what would I put here for f values for, if I, all my subintervals are going from i going from 1 to n, so what, what, what do I have to put here to account for the next subinterval? f of what? What? Um, no? OK, so I've covered i equals 1 here. So then I just move on to i equals 2, 3, 4. So just i equals 2. x1. And then f of x2. All right. Um, stop that. OK. Um, continue. i equals 3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 3. I'm not sure why I put an i in there, but OK. All right. And then this will keep going. Whoa. Stop that. No. Last time I paid 100 bucks or something, it's shitty. Um, pardon my French. <laughs> Good point. Um, OK, now it's cooperating. Um, and then the last subinterval would be x. Well, what, what it would be for last subinterval? n minus 1, OK, and then f of x, n. All right, um, so that covers the approximation. And then what I'll do is, I'm going to go into the next line for no. Oh, wait, I need to, OK. I should add up all the class that I've lost just from fighting with this thing and build a guide for it. <sighs> okay. Um, all right. So now for the error, we have the summation again of all this. Now I'm going to take anything I'm able to factor out and go ahead and do the, go ahead and factor it out. So minus h cubed over 12, and then I have a sum of these. Um, derivative values at unknown points. Okay. Now I'll deal with that a little later. Um, now let's look at the approximation though. Because take f of x1, it's a second value in the first subinterval, first value of a second subinterval. That's why it's appearing twice. Every single one of these appears twice, except which ones? Yeah, um, yeah x0 and xn, the, the endpoints. So f of a only appears once. F of b only appears once. All others appear twice. So I can go ahead and um, condense this. Oh, it's gone to another page. OK. Hold on. I hate having these things go across pages. OK. No. That doesn't look right. All right, 
So now, um, okay, so now I'll have, I'll just write as f of a for a first value, and then I have f of b for the last point, because xn is equal to b. In between, I'll have everything else. So I'll have a, uh, I, so it's going to be 2 f of x1, 2 f of x2, and so forth, all the way up to 2 f of x n minus 1. So I'll just make a sum, summation here, 1 up to n minus 1 of f of xi. So, so that covers all the interior points. So we just add up those function values and double that. So if the weights are 1, and then 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and then 1, and all of that's multiplied on the outside by h over 2. So this is my approximation. Now there's still the error to deal with um, that I have up here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide by, um, by n. So I'm going to have an n up here, and then to compensate, I'm going to put another n down here, and then I have a sum, okay, of uh, uh, second derivative values at unknown points. Now the reason I'm doing that is uh, first I'm going to break up as h cubed as h times h squared. Okay, now, if we keep in mind how h is defined, and I'm going to scroll back up to that. All right, so keep in mind we have this nh down here. I want to do something about that. Okay, look at how h is defined. How can I express nh? Just from this, what would n times h be? b minus a, yeah. And um, so I'll just change it to that. Okay. So this is going to be b minus a. All right. Now, the last thing to focus on for the error is, so this part right here, 1 over n times the sum of these values. If I'm adding something up and dividing by n, what is that? What do we call that? Yes, yeah, an average. Yeah, so average of these values. And by the intermediate value theorem, if we assume enough double prime is continuous, this average can be replaced by, because all of these uh, unknown points are within AB. So I can replace this average by a single value of F double prime at an unknown point. So we saw this sum of numerical differentiation just with two values, but this applies for any number of values. Um, but um, uh, because... Uh, um, because the average is going to be between the maximum and the minimum of these things. So by the intermediate value theorem, there, ha there has to be a value of this function that lies somewhere between. So I can just change this to, okay, so I'll copy and paste this. Whoa, stop, don't do that. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to get rid of a summation. So or get rid of the averaging, and I'll just replace this with f double prime at one unknown point. And then I'm done. So here, this is the composite trapezoidal rule, and this is the error. And because the error is proportional to h squared, um, that doesn't look like composite trapezoidal rule is second order accurate. So in other words, the error is, using a big node notation we've seen before, it's um, big O of h squared. Um, okay. Oh, wait. All right. Um, so what that means is, for example, if you decide to double the number of subintervals, then the error will decrease by a factor of roughly 4. If you cut h by a factor of 10, the error should be reduced by a factor of about 100. Um, 
So, so we have some idea as to um, how to um, uh, get the accuracy that we want. So what we can do is, um, so the importance of the error formula for a composite rule um, is that um, if we know how big f double prime can be on the interval a, b, can set the error less than some tolerance, like for instance, suppose we want the error to be less than 10 to the minus 5, for instance. Um, and then we can solve for n, um, the number of function valuations. And the reason for that is um, we want to get away with as few function valuations as we can. Um, because for composite trapezoidal rule, we can go ahead and evaluate f at like thousands of points, and chances are the error is going to be nice and small. But what if we can get away with far fewer than that? Um, we that we need to. That, that, so computing resources are, um, are are still limited, and also we expect a whole lot of them because uh, we like realistic simulations and uh, lifelike computer graphics in our movies and so forth, um, which actually rely heavily on numerical analysis. Um, our uh, the computer graphics group at uh, Stanford, they've gotten film credits. They would uh, drive up to uh, Lucasfilm Studios that were just across the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, consult on those movies. Um, and because their methods for solving partial differential equations played a role in creating realistic effects. And they uh, had a rule around there that um, just, be just because George Lucas says hello to you, like in, in the cafeteria line, it doesn't mean he wants to start a conversation. He's just being polite. So you just leave him alone. Um, so, um, so that's just one of the applications of these, these, uh, these things. OK. Um, and I'll, I'll, if, if time permits, I'll show an example of this um, in a little bit. Um, so any questions about this? Composite trapezoidal rule and how it came about. Now, using a similar idea, you can um, get formulas for other um, uh, composite rules. So the composite midpoint rule. Um, so you apply the uh, basic midpoint rule. On uh, each uh, subinterval, um, and what we get is the uh, exact integral is equal to a sum. And so, for each application midpoint rule, you have the width of the interval, which is just going to be h, but I'll just factor that out. And then you have the value of f at um, At the midpoint, which would be i minus a half. Um, so, so for instance, the first subinterval is x naught to x one. So you pick x sub one half, and that's where that's the x value that you plug into f. Uh, or written another way, that would be the same as x i minus one plus h over two. Uh, so that's another way you can you can view it. So as for what you plug into f. Um, and then the error obtained in the same way. I won't repeat it. Um, as we'll, they did the same thing as in here, and we get uh, it's also second order accurate. Um, so it's h squared over 24, still b minus a. So all the composite rules have this kind of setup with the error uh, times f double prime at an unknown point in a b. Um, so um, as we saw the, the Basic rule case: the uh, midpoint rule is uh, roughly twice as accurate as the uh, composite trapezoidal rule. Um, all right, so all right, and then finally, um, composites. Simpson's rule, 
Well, we do in that case, that has three nodes. So we apply Simpson's rule on each pair of subintervals. Um, so the, the setup is um, so the integral is equal to so I'm going to have a sum from 1 to n over 2. So in other words, um, we are requiring that the number of subintervals n has to be even, or this just won't make sense. Okay. Um, so we have n over 2 terms, each one involving Simpson's rule. So that's going to be b minus a, uh, well, 2h over 6. Now, actually, I need to... Um, so scroll up a bit, refresh your memory, Simpson's rule, right here. It's the width of your sub, your interval over 6, and then we have value of f at the endpoints plus 4 times the value at the midpoint. Um, and then we have the error term. So I can use the same idea down here, where the width of the region that you're applying Simpson's rule 2 is 2h because it's each pair of subintervals and each has width h. So then you have um, f of the left endpoint plus 4 times f at the midpoint. Oh, actually, wait, I need, okay, hold on a second. Um, this is going to be x naught, x2, x4, even numbered points. So I need to fix my index. So that's going to be um, 2i minus 2. And then uh, for the midpoint, that's going to be x, 2i minus 1. So, so it's, it's the next point. And then over here, I have the next point, 2i. And, that, and this is because I'm, you're working with pairs of subintervals. So um, now I, what I'm going to do is, like before, I'm going to write this out. Actually, I'm going to um, I need to include the error in here, so that's so that's going to be minus. All right, so I have uh, the width of my subinterval is two h to the fifth power over ninety times fourth derivative at an unknown point, and this comes from the error formula for Simpson's rule up above. So the error is minus fourth derivative over 90, width of your uh, interval that you're applying it to, all raised to the fifth power. So I've just replicated that down here. OK. <clears throat> um, now, um, what I need to do, like with the composite traps little rule, is simplify this. So I'm going to, um, so I have h over 3. I can factor out. And then what do we have in between? So we have f of x naught, your first point, when i equals 1, plus 4 f of x1 plus f of x2. So this comes from a first application of Simpson's rule. Then I go to i equals 2. So I plug in i equals 2 throughout, and I'll have f of x2 plus 4 f of x3 plus f of x4. And this keeps going. So I, uh, all the way to the end. So I have f of uh, n minus 2 plus 4 fxn minus 1 plus fxn. All right, so that concludes the approximation part. And then for the error, I'll factor out what I can. So I'm going to have 32 
Well, I still have a sum. Um, I have, um, actually, I'm going to break this up. Um, okay. Well, okay, 32h to the fifth over 90. Whoa. How did that happen? I really don't want that much space in between. Um, fourth to okay, that's more like it. Fourth derivative at uh, unknown point, and that's just really weirding me out. Why is that happening? Thirty-two h fifth over ninety. I'm not sure what that number is doing there either. That's really mysterious. Okay. Um, well, at least it's in there. I'll sort it out later. Um, okay. Now, um, oh, but the 32 h to the fifth over 90. That doesn't depend on i. So that can be factored out of the sum. So I'll go ahead and do that. OK. Um, oh. No, that's not it. OK. Never mind. Um, No, why are you doing that? Okay. Sorry. I really don't know what's going on here. It's why all my stuff is disappearing. Okay. Okay. So, first, what we have here is f of x2 appears twice. So, just like in the composite trapezoidal rule, these instances can be combined. So I'm going to do this down below separately because I'm tired of what's happening up above. So that would be h over 3 times f of x0 plus 4 f of x1 plus 2 f of x2 plus 4 f of x3. And so notice even numbered points multiplied by 2, odd numbered points multiplied by 4, except for the last, the first and last. Well, uh, just have a coefficient of one. Okay, so that's the approximation. So I'll put approximately equals there. Um, so just from condensing things as much as possible. So what's interesting is the number of function evaluations is exactly the same for a trapezoidal rule, composite trapezoidal and composite Simpsons. What's different is what they're multiplied by. So trapezoidal, you had h over 2 out front. And then you have a weight pattern of 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and then 1. Both Simpsons, it's h over 3 out front. And then your weights are 1, 4, 2, 4, 2, and so forth, ending on a 4 and then a 1. Um, but that produces a whole lot more accuracy, not in every case, but in most cases. Uh, so the error, what happens is I'm summing over. Um, uh, n over 2. So, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to copy the error term I had before and simplify it. Okay. All right. So, so what happens is I'm going to take 2h um, and then I'm going to have uh, n over 2, and this will be reduced to 16, and this will be h to the 4. And then I'm going to have um, n over 2 here. And here I'm doing the same averaging thing um, as before. So what I end up with is... Um, so I'm going to have f, the fourth derivative, minus 
at a um, unknown point, and then I'm going to have h to the fourth times b minus a. Um, so, because here I have 2h times n over 2. The 2's cancel, and then n times h is going to be b minus a again. So just like the Travis Little rule, that's how this part um, appeared. And then um, this n over 2, that got sucked into the um, average. And, um, okay. Oh. Um, let's see. Although it's a little puzzling here. that the constant that's supposed to wind up down there is 180, but that is not what would result from what we've seen here. Um, unless I messed up up above. Um, okay. Oh. Um, oh, I think I know why. What? Sorry, what? Oh, for a basic rule, yeah. Oh, here's why. I messed up. This, uh, I had, um, is b minus a over 2 raised to the fifth, not b minus a to the fifth. Okay. So I should have not h to the fifth, but just, not 2h, but just h to the fifth. So I'll go ahead and fix all of those. That way that 32 doesn't appear in the first place. Um, and then when I... Simplify the error down below. I'm going to have, um, okay, so this is not there. I'm just going to have h here and then an n. But the thing is, for the averaging part, I have to divide by n over 2. So then I have to multiply by n over 2, which introduces an additional factor of 2 down below. So that's why it's 180. Okay. All right. So it worked out in the end. It started with the wrong thing. Okay. So what we have here is um, that uh, Simpson's rule is fourth order accurate. Uh, but it's not always more accurate than the others. And uh, that, that we'll see that when I cover... Um, Romberg integration. Now also, uh, one of the explorations in um, this section shows that um, these, uh, uh, you have to really pay attention not just to the h to a fourth part. Every part of the error formula is important, including its higher order derivative. If its higher order derivative is particularly large or maybe undefined, um, or for some functions it can, it can get really large, like near an endpoint, for instance, then um, that would so like if the second derivative is well behaved, but the fourth derivative is not, then midpoint or trapezoidal rule will have an advantage compared to uh, Simpson's rule. So don't assume that higher order accuracy in the error formula always means it's going to be uh, more accurate. Okay. Um, now, let's see. Unfortunately, there are only seven minutes left, but. Um, so I want to point out um, uh, one of the examples in the text. Example 6.4 point, and I'll step through it here for you. Okay, example 8.4.1. Um, using the error formulas to solve for the number of uh, subintervals so n, that are needed to achieve a desired um, level of accuracy. So you want to get all the, you want to get all the accuracy you need without, 
and doing the minimum amount of work to get it. Um, so if we just take a look at that, okay, make this a little bigger. All right, so this is actually the integral we were dealing with last time. I guess it's one of my favorite for illustration purposes. Integral of uh, zero from zero to one e to the x. So we want the um, error to be. We want to get three decimal places correct. So let's just say the error is less than uh, 0 0.001, so 10 to the minus 3. How large does n have to be to make that happen? So here we have the error formula for the composite trapezoidal rule. So what I do is um, I fill in my particulars. So my f is e to the x, so I fill in its second derivative. Um, and so the question is, how big can all of this get? Well, your unknown point is in your interval 0 to 1. So the absolute largest the second derivative can be is e, because your second derivative e to the x is e to the x, and x, or really eta, is between 0 and 1. And e to the x is an increasing function, so, um, so this part is bounded above by e. Um, and then what I do is um, I replace h by its definition. h is equal to b minus a over n. So in this example, that's 1 over n. So what I want to do is I want to express the error formula in terms of n, not h. So here is what it uh, simplifies to. Actually, this is what it simplifies to, e over 12n squared. So the error is at most this for whatever value of n I pick. So I just go ahead and set that less than 10 to the minus 3, and I go ahead and solve for n. And this is what I get, uh, roughly 15. So I need to choose n to be at least that much. So I go ahead and choose n equal um, 16, and then I'm guaranteed of uh, that level of accuracy. Um, so if you have some idea of how big your high order derivative can get, um, like for instance for trig functions, that's particularly easy to get a bound for that, um, like sine and cosine at least, um, then that helps us choose our n. Um, but now if I want to do the same thing with a composite Simpson's rule, here's my error formula, and I do the same thing. So, um, so then um, I plug in my fourth derivative, e, so I, I'm going to get e over here, and then I have uh, h is b minus a over n, so it's 1 over n, so I get 180n to the fourth downstairs. And so now I just solve, I set this less than 10 to the minus 3 and solve for n again. So I just go ahead and do the algebra and I get roughly 2. So what that means is the basic Simpson's rule, just using two subintervals, so only applying Simpson's rule once is enough. Um, so and uh, actually, this is what I did last class, and I got this answer, um, and that's correct to three decimal places. So, um, so this shows that in most cases, uh, composite Simpson's rule will require far fewer function evaluations than um, uh, like composite trapezoidal rule, composite uh, um, midpoint rule. Okay. Um, so. Um, so this is how the um, error formula is uh, useful for helping you apply these rules um, more efficiently. So, uh, like, uh, so professionally made software that uh, performs uh, numerical integration um, tries to minimize function evaluations by uh, getting some idea of how the integrand behaves and using that information to uh, choose the uh, proper spacing. Now, they actually use unequal spacing. That's called adaptive quadrature, um, where you apply like Simpson's rule or trapezoidal rule on um, subintervals uh, to uh, try to estimate the error, and then use that estimate to figure out: Do you need to divide these subintervals further, or are you fine with the ones that you have? Um, so, and that's something. Unfortunately, it's one of the topics that's not being covered. Uh, in this class this semester, it's uh, section um, it's uh, section eight point seven, um, but uh, um, so, so but that's just one way in which we try to 
um, get the most accuracy for released work. So uh, that's how numerical analysts are. They invest a whole lot of effort so that computers could be lazy. Okay, so, so that's composite rules. Um, and it looks like I'm out of time anyway, so I will begin with actually my favorite topic of the whole semester because it's a huge role in my research, Gauss quadrature on uh, Tuesday. So I know you'll be in Thanksgiving mode, but um, try, uh, try to follow along anyway. <clears throat>